doing well. And I just want to thank you for the opportunity to come and speak with you today. Uh, it's a pretty small group, I think about 12 people. So certainly if there's any questions or anything that I'm saying that doesn't make sense, please, please feel free to you know, chime in and I'll, I'll you know, go ahead and answer those questions or clarify any statements I make. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So I was asked to give a talk on cervical cancer and uh, you know, the historical norm has been, we remember seeing our gynecologist once a year, getting a pap smear once a year. And that was kind of the thing to do. And so much has changed over the last 20 to 30 years, especially in cervical cancer with research on HPV, which is a human papillomavirus we'll talk about more in detail. And even the screening itself has changed because pap smears used to be just go ahead and get a pap smear once a year. But now with the HPV test, there are some nuances and some differences. And some patients that may already have seen their gynecologist who said, well, we don't need to do it every year. We can do it once every three years or once every five years. And you know, when, when we're doing it less often, I think certainly patients always have this sense of fear of change. And why is it being done less? Are we missing something? Are you doctor, is it okay for me to do that? So we'll kind of discuss uh, some of that here today and hopefully be able to answer some questions. So I have nothing to disclose. And as we discussed objectives, well, first, I just want to uh, go through some relevant anatomy, uh, talk about cervical cancer screening, what that means, uh, how we do it now, and what the current recommendations are. Also, HPV vaccination guidelines. There are, there's a vaccine now for the HPV virus, and which has been around over 10 years, uh, and has certainly increased uh, utilization over the last 10 years in terms of uh, getting our children vaccinated before they're ever exposed to HPV. And I'm sorry for the typo here, but uh, the basic principles of cervical cancer treatment. So this is just a simple schematic or drawing of uh, the female reproductive anatomy. And as you can see, the cervix, which I'll zoom in on and outlined in a green box, is essentially the neck of the uterus, and that's the best way to describe it, I think. I mean, we know that there's the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries, but the cervix is really the portion that the physician, I as a gynecologist, can see when I do the exam. So when we do the speculum exam, I can see the walls of the vagina and see, you know, the outer portion of the cervix. And so that's the part we're focusing on when we're performing cervical cancer screening, or we know as pap smear. Now, in terms of cervical cancer, how big of a problem is it in the United States? Uh, there's about 13,800 new cases diagnosed annually in the US and about 4,290 women who pass away from cervical cancer. And so the five year survival is approximately 66%. Uh, now for myself as a GYN oncologist, uh, the most common cancer is endometrial cancer. And the number of cases in, you know, is on average about 55 to 60,000. So this is approximately a fourth or a fifth less um, in terms of number. Now, in terms of ages of cervical cancer, uh, it's most often diagnosed between the age of 35 to 44, and the average age is approximately 50. But we can't forget that 20% of cervical cancers are actually diagnosed in women who are over 65. So a lot of times it's often thought that, okay, young people are getting pap smears and at some point the pap smear screening stops. So we really think of cervical cancer as a cancer that's found in younger women, but we really do need to remember that 20% are found in women over 65. And most of the women that have cervical cancer over the age of 65 have not received regular screening. Now, in terms of HPV or human papillomavirus, this is actually the most common sexually transmitted infection. Uh, certainly we know about gonorrhea, chlamydia, herpes, syphilis, HIV, but HPV is something that's been more recently uh, discovered and used in uh, cervical cancer screening. It's also the causative agent of cervical cancer. So this virus actually causes abnormal changes in the cervix, which then lead to cervical cancer. And in about 99% of cervical cancers, HPV, the DNA, the genetic makeup of the virus is actually found. So it's responsible for approximately 98 to 99% of cervical cancers. And we do have a test to detect this now. 
So this slide uh, just kind of talks about how HPV initiates the changes that go from initially the first box, which shows HPV infection, going on to when HPV becomes persistent. So typically, our own immune system can get rid of the HPV virus. And that's why many times in the women's lives, they'll have HPV several times throughout their life, particularly in their younger years. And this can be cleared. Now, the problem becomes when HPV is what's called persistent. It doesn't go away and it hangs around. Then it can go to the third box, which causes cellular dysregulation. And that's just a fancy term to say that the cells are becoming abnormal. And if that continues on, then we have what's called high grade CIN. And CIN just stands for cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. And that means abnormal cells. And when we talk about grades, we're talking about high grade, which you know then confers a precancerous condition, whereas low grade would be just abnormal cells. And once patients have this high grade CIN, which I'll go into more detail in the next couple of slides, over a period of approximately three to seven years, patients will develop invasive cancer, or what we know as cervical cancer, if there is no treatment. Now, in the bottom left, there's a picture of a cervix with cancer. And this is what we would see in the office. Uh, this is the part, the round part of the cervix, and on the upper portion, you can see an abnormal looking area, and that's cancer. So this patient had undergone surgery, and so you can see the uterus uh, above, and then off to each side, you can see the ovaries. So we had talked about CIN, or basically abnormal cells of the cervix, and we discussed grades, which is grades one, two and three. And so on the left hand side, we have CIN1, which is not considered a precancer, but just abnormal cells of the cervix. And over half the time, this will go away on its own, meaning that our own immune systems can clear the HPV virus and can clear these abnormal changes that have occurred on the cervix. In the middle box, we have CIN2 and 3. And this is what we discussed prior, that high grade uh, uh, cervical dysplasia or abnormal cells. And approximately 30 to 40% of the time, our body can actually clear this abnormal, uh, at these abnormal cells. Now, when our body is not able to do that and HPV persists, over approximately three to seven years on average, this high grade CIN, or what we see in the middle, the two and the three, can progress to cancer. And if we look at the very right, uh, we, we look at what is the risk of progression to cancer. So when we talk about CIN1, it's approximately 1%, but CIN2 are five and greater than 12%, CIN2 and three. So when we talk about CIN in general or abnormal cells, you'll hear a doctor say, well, on the biopsy, we found CIN1. So that means generally not a precancer, or they talk about high grade CIN or CIN2 and 3. And those are the patients we need to go then treat further. And we'll talk about that in later slides. Now, in terms of cervical cancer screening, uh, this was developed by Dr. George Papanicolaou. He was a physician pathologist that uh, initially looked at uh, scrapings of the cervix and saw that patients who ended up developing cervical cancer actually had these abnormal cells. And knowing that, he was then able to develop this test called a, what we know as a pap smear or a pap test. And that became the standard by the 1960s. So it seems like a long time ago, but really it isn't that long um, ago that we actually uh, first had pap smears. Before this period of time, there was really no clear screening and no early way to find you know, precancer or cancer. Now, in terms of cervical cancer screening, uh, there's a couple of images here, but on the bottom left, um, oftentimes women don't get to see this portion of it, but uh, there is a broom on the very left, that's the blue uh, wand with a white tip. And then on the very right is a brush, and in the middle is what we call a spatula. Now, these are the devices that we use at the time of a speculum exam to perform what's known as a pap smear. And a pap smear essentially is just a scraping 
of the cervix. So almost like an exfoliation. So we are able to look at the cells and that's the bottom picture on the right, um, showing different types of cervical cells that are scraped. Now in the upper right, the HPV test, which is something that's been incorporated into the algorithm for screening, because we know that again, 99% of cervical cancers are actually caused by HPV. So if we know which patients have this HPV virus and their specific types, then we can help better target who do we, you know, look at more closely, who do we screen more often, and then who do we actually treat. And in, just in terms of this graph, it shows you quite the success uh, that pap smear screening itself has, uh, you know, achieved in terms of the uh, incidence of uh, cervical cancer in the United States. And so if we look all the way to the left, approximately in 1930, there were about 30 women per 100,000 women that were getting cervical cancer. And then there was this large decline over time through the 50s and 60s with the advent of pap smears and down now to the 1990, 2000s and on, it's been a pretty flat and that's around the seven to eight women per 100,000. And so the question may be, well, okay, there's been a large decline certainly from the 30 range to the seven to eight range, but how come we're not seeing a further decline? And the likely reason for this is that not every woman in our country gets pap smear screening or some sort of cervical cancer screening. And again, you know, screening, the whole point, just like a colonoscopy, uh, is to find something before it's a cancer or find a cancer earlier on as opposed to cancer that's developed at a later stage and has spread to other areas. And obviously those patients have worse outcomes than someone who had cancer caught early or a pre-cancer even. Again, the goals of cervical cancer screening, again, are to detect precancers or find it before it's ever a cancer. And then number two, to detect or find them at an early stage. And so that we can have, you know, the best outcomes for patients. And hopefully, you know, if patients are able to get screening in our country across the board, and, and this would be an argument for patients having equal access to healthcare, um, would be that cervical cancer really shouldn't exist in our society in this day and age in our country where we have the financial resources, which is very much different from other countries where pap smears are, are not part of the medical care or standard medical care. So cervical cancer, it is almost entirely preventable. As we had said, about 98, 99% of cervical cancers are caused by this virus, human papillomavirus or HPV. Proper screening can diagnose precancers or early stage cervical cancer, and that means before it's spread outside of the cervix. Now, questions that come up are, well, how often should women be screened? I mean, there's a lot of differences that are occurring nowadays because there are uh, cancer societies making recommendations as to who should be screened, when should we start screening, and how should we screen, and what tests to use. And it's actually very confusing for uh, you know, gynecologists and GYN oncologists such as myself if you talk to 10 gynecologists today, I guarantee you, you'll have several different opinions about who they screen, how often they do it, and what tests they use. And it's because there isn't a one size fits all screening method. And you know there have been a lot of changes over the last 10 years. And so particularly physicians who've been out of training, you kind of do what you used to do. And so they may not be keeping up to date. So we'll kind of get into uh, more of the details about why this has changed, how it's changed, and you know how this may be beneficial for patients, and you know also to reduce anxiety because whenever we do anything less, like mammograms, colonoscopies, pap smears, there is going to be a level of concern. You know, patients will say, "Hey, Doctor Lee, you know I really used to do this every year. Is it really okay for me not to have a pap smear this year? Are you sure I'm going to be okay?" And those are questions that, you know, I hear quite a bit from patients. And so we talk about this. Now, there are several different cancer societies. One is the American Cancer Society or ACS. Uh, the other is US uh, Present Preventive Services Task Force or the US PSTF. And some others that have different recommendations in terms of screening. They all are based on the same principles, but the 
age cutoffs and uh, how often to screen may vary a little bit. We'll stick with the American Cancer Society here to uh, you know, make it for simplicity's sake. Now on the left, we have three different tests, essentially two different tests and the last one is a combination of the two. So cytology is that exfoliation or the pap smear that I was talking about. And that again, used to be done once every year. So it's very easy. You saw your doctor for an annual visit, you got a pap smear, no questions. And you kept doing that going forward unless there was abnormal. And then you would have further investigation. With the discovery of HPV and knowing that HPV is the causative agent in approximately 98 to 99% of cervical cancers, then there's a portion of patients who are initially undergoing tests with HPV. Um, it wasn't widespread in the beginning. Not everyone could get it done. Not on, on all insurances would cover HPV testing. And so HPV, if you think of, uh, let's say cars, for example, and there's so many different brands of cars, HPV uh, also has lots of different types and they're, they're numbered. So for example, 16, 18, 31, 33, 35, there are certain numbers of HP that are the high risk HPVs. So the most common ones are 16 and 18, and they're responsible for the great majority of the cervical cancers that we see. Now, there are also types like HPV 6 and 11, and those are the types of HPV that cause genital warts, which is different from cervical cancer. Uh, so th these are the tests that we are currently using. One is the pap smear, and then the other is the HPV test, which we're looking specifically for the high risk subtypes. Now, as I had said, there's three different methods of testing. The last one is combining the two, meaning doing a pap smear and also you know, running an HPV test on that pap smear itself. So in terms of the American Cancer Society, uh, the recommendations are to begin screening at 25. Before, in the past, historically, it was 18, and then once a year. Then it was, you know, not before the age of 21, um, or until the patients become sexually active. And now it's 25. So the screening uh, is for patients generally age 25 to approximately 65. And the options exist. There are three different options. If you look at uh, the right-hand column, and uh, there's a in bold primary HPV test every five years, meaning no pap smear, although we do perform it to get the HPV sample, but uh, just running an HPV test every five years. And that is uh, quite uh, disconcerting for a lot of patients who have been used to getting you know, pap smears once a year to wait five years before any testing is done. Or the second one is a co-test, which means a combination of the two, the routine pap smear that we do, plus HPV testing, and that would be done every five years as well. And the last option would be no HPV testing, but just the pap smear itself every three years. Now, questions are okay. We have this three different methods of screening, and it's in some form of three to five year intervals. Now, when do we stop screening? At some point, uh, screening at a certain age doesn't necessarily make sense to continue to do so. Now, the current recommendations are approximately about 65 years of age. Uh, and that's assuming that a patient has never had a precancer, meaning CIN2 or 3, within the last 25 years. And they've had 10 years of negative screening. So that would mean a pap smear and HPV every five years twice, just the HPV test every five years twice, or just the pap smear every three years, three times. So that, that's kind of a mouthful and <laughs> it's a lot to keep track of. And I think it makes it difficult for patients to remember, do I get a pap smear this year? Do I not? And I think for physicians as well, um, it can be confusing. I, specifically in my notes, I always document the date that a patient has a pap smear and I put in my plan for every single patient, when is their next pap smear? Um, I do some, a little bit of a hybrid of this. Uh, uh, working in a cancer center and seeing you know, almost nearly all cancer patients, I don't feel comfortable waiting for five years. 
and knowing that even pre-cancers, CIN2 and 3, will take at least three to seven years on average to turn into cancer, I actually perform uh, the cytology, the pap smear, and the HPV test every three years in patients who have had normal testing. And so that's not um, a general recommendation by any means, um, but it's an amalgamation of the different uh, recommendations that are out there. So myself personally, I do uh, testing every three years on my patients if they've had normal testing prior. Now, some women uh, have come to me and said, oh, you know, Dr. Lee, I've had a hysterectomy with myself or, you know, uh, another provider. And uh, they ask me, well, do I need pap smears anymore? And I say, well, if you've had normal pap smears in the past, you've not had any cervical dysplasia or the abnormal cells or precancer, then after a hysterectomy and what patients would call a full hysterectomy, where the uterus and the cervix are removed, then you don't have a cervix anymore. So you don't need pap smears. So again, in patients who have had normal pap smears, who've had a hysterectomy with removing the cervix, they do not need pap smears. Now, those are kind of the general recommendations and we have special situations. On the left-hand column, um, these recommendations are where it doesn't apply to a certain set, subset of individuals. And so, as we had talked about, HPV is a virus that is uh, the cause for cervical cancer. And our immune system can actually clear that virus. Just like when we get the flu, our body can get over the flu, similar to that. So patients who have had a uh, kidney transplant or have had leukemia and a stem cell transplantation and are immunosuppressed or taking anti-rejection medications, this does not apply. So those patients should go and get screening once a year. Patients with HIV need to get tested once a year. And anybody who's immunosuppressed from other causes need to get tested once a year. Uh, DES or diethylstilvestrol was a medication in use in this country from about 1938 to 1971. So uh, those patients who were exposed, meaning while they were a fetus inside their mother's womb, those patients are at elevated risk for developing what's called cervical cancer, but specifically a rare type that is uh, very aggressive called clear cell cervical cancer and vaginal cancer. So again, that, those group of patients also, these standard recommendations do not apply. They should be followed and tested once a year. Now, patients uh, that these recommendations still apply to. So patients who have had, uh, uh, who have a cervix um, and uh, who don't have symptoms um, and whether or not they've had an HPV vaccination. So patients have asked me, well, Dr. Lee, I got an HPV vaccination. Do I need to do, uh, you know, pap smear screening? And yes, the answer is yes. So HPV vaccination helps prevent being infected with HPV, um, but you still need to get the screening. Patients who've had what's called a supra cervical hysterectomy. And so those patients are patients who've had hysterectomy, but the cervix is le left in place. And that is a procedure that's done uh, generally by the general gynecologist. And um, it's done when uh, hysterectomy is very difficult um, or uh, for patients who want to have their cervix left in place. And so those patients obviously still need to get uh, screening. And then transgender men who have a cervix. So those uh, patients also need continued screening. So in terms of HPV vaccine, um, it was approved in 2006. So it's already 15 years ago that it's been approved. Um, but the initial uptake, um, if you look at the bottom part of the graph encircled in red, and this is the uptake of the HPV vaccine, as opposed to the uptake of, uh, you know, the tetanus and diphtheria vaccine, that's the upper line, uppermost line. It was approximately uh, just under 20% in 2011, so five years after it was, um, you know, approved. And then it has increased over time. And then the last portion of this graph in 2018, approximately about 50% of, uh, you know, women aged 13 to 17. And I say women 
but what I really mean is young children age 13 to 17 because the HPV vaccination is not for women only it is for women and men and the reason for that is it's a sexually transmitted virus so men are generally asymptomatic carriers meaning that if they have HPV men won't know and the way I explain this to my patients is if you look at the penis the penis the skin of the penis is like my hand and the skin, quote unquote, or we call it the mucosa of the vagina and cervix is more like the inside of the mouth. And so if you can imagine what's easier to injure or damage, not the skin of our hand, but more the inside of the mucosa. And so that's why women are uh, particularly susceptible to HPV and can develop um, these changes that lead to cervical cancer. Now that's with the higher risk HPV types, but both men and women are susceptible to HPV that are the non-high risk types that lead to genital warts. And so the current uh, vaccine, vaccine that we carry or that we use com most commonly is called Gardasil. And it protects against the types that cause genital warts as well as cancer. And so again, on this graph, it's only 50%. Uh, you would think that, hey, we have a vaccine to prevent cancer. Uh, you would think that everyone would be getting it. Uh, but that's not the case. And I think part of it lies in the fact that number one, um, the counseling is done by the pediatricians who do an amazing job, but again, it's in, in consultation with their parents. And uh, you know, the biggest uh, stigma was that, hey, we're giving a vaccine for S an STD or a sexually transmitted disease. Um, and once you hear that, you know, parents may be a little hesitant to you know, say, let's get my child this vaccine. Um, and really the message should be that we have a vaccine to prevent cervical cancer. And it really needs to be given before first intercourse, uh, before you're sexually active. Because once you're sexually active, you're already exposed to HPV potentially. Now, this slide uh, you know, talks about why do we kind of maybe phase out the pap smear itself and why are we going more towards HPV testing or a combination form of testing and so in the left hand column uh, the first uh, row is sensitivity for precancer and that means if there is a precancer how likely is it that this test will find it so when we talk about cytology or the first column of pap smear um, the sensitivity is actually low meaning the likelihood that a pap smear will find a precancer in and of itself, just by itself, is pretty low. The HPV test by itself is actually higher because we know that HPV is a causative agent. And then if you do both together, um, that's the highest. In terms of the second row where we talk about, well, if the tests are all normal, how often do we need to do the testing again? And because a pap smear by itself is not a highly sensitive test, then the repeat interval or how often it needs to be done is currently recommended at three years. Whereas getting an HPV test or the test together is uh, once every five years. Now, anybody with abnormal pap smears or abnormal or HPV tests that are positive, those patients will typically go on to what we call the colposcopy. And if any of you have had that, it's where we kind of take like a microscope. And while we're performing a speculum exam, we use a microscope to look in on the cervix after coating it with acetic acid or vinegar. Uh, and that allows us to see abnormal changes on the cervix. And if we see those, then we perform a biopsy to see if there's truly those abnormal cells or the CIN as we had talked about. Now, in terms of screening, uh, used to be 18, then 21, now 25. And so what's the reason behind delaying screening? Why, why do we wait um, you know, until the age of 25? And so there have been a lot of studies that uh, have looked at women ages 21 to 24 and have followed these women and they've shown little benefit um, to uh, doing this pap smear screening in terms of decreasing the number of cases of actual cancer. And the reason for that is most of these women, as we have talked about, have HPV multiple times in their life and their body, their immune system can clear it. So they don't have time to ever get the HPV to cause the precancer or cancer. Uh, 
And anytime we have an abnormal test, as I've mentioned, we have to do additional testing. And so those are biopsies. Sometimes patients undergo additional procedures. And so there can be some overtreatment. And that's why the age has been increased to the age of 25. So now HPV screening in the 20s, the 2020s. Uh, again, in 2012, uh, the prior recommendation was from the age of 21 to 29, we just did a pap smear every three years, no HPV testing. Uh, because those patients had a very high rate of HPV infection, approximately 50% of the patients had HPV, but they would clear it. And so that doing the additional HPV testing um, didn't seem to make a difference. Now, HPV 16 and 18 are the majority or cause the majority of cervical cancers from HPV. And uh, the positivity was highest in women aged 25 through 29. And more than half of the women in this group who had uh, the cervical precancer, CIN2 or 3, had a negative pap smear. So again, pap smears we know are helpful, but they don't find uh, abnormalities when an abnormality exists the majority of the time. So they're not a very sensitive test. And so HPV itself was much better at finding abnormalities than a pap smear in and of itself. And that's why uh, these age recommendations have changed. And then that's why now, even though in 2012, they said don't do any HPV test for if you're 21 to 29, that has now changed. And so these over the last 10 years, pap smear screening has changed so much. Uh, to be honest, I, I have to go back and look at uh, recommendations myself. Um, and I know a lot of gynecologists, there's so many different uh, methods of screening because it has changed numerous times. So ending screening at age 65, um, they've looked at uh, modeling where we take um, rates of uh, cervical cancer and they've modeled out to, let's say you were to get screening until you're 90. And if you were to do that, you would prevent um, basically one death for every 2000 women. Um, and that would be at the cost of doing 127 additional biopsies. Now, I don't like talking about finances when it comes to healthcare, but these are how decisions are made by cancer screening societies. You weigh out the risk and the benefit to the society as a whole, as opposed to just one individual person. And so essentially what this model is showing is that patients are much more likely to pass from another cause as opposed to cervical cancer. And thus cervical cancer screening does not continue for example, this model to up to the age of 90. Now, in terms of management of abnormal pap smears, uh, in 2019, there was a consensus group, um, the ASCCP, um, that looked at uh, cervical cancer testing, abnormalities that existed, and the risk of progression or development of cervical cancer. And this is a little bit more complex slide, but what really is important now is just to talk about that the way we actually follow patients and actually manage patients with pap smear abnormalities. It used to be in the past, if a pap smear is abnormal, we would do a colposcopy, looking with a microscope and placing vinegar and then taking biopsies as needed. Now it's more based upon the current set of results that you have and your past history, using both together and trying to look at patients who would have at least uh, a higher risk for development of uh, cervical precancer and then managing patients in that way. And this is so complex, there is an app now, there's an app for everything. So on my iPhone, I have this app, uh, I've downloaded it uh, and I use this app quite a bit. Uh, and when we use this algorithm, uh, because there's a lot of different variables and a lot of other uh, data that has to go into it, it's very helpful. It gives you a, the first, uh, the, the right hand most side gives you what is basically, what is the recommendation given the results that we have and the patient's past history. And so it's based upon a risk 
And so if the risk is greater than uh, 4%, then generally the recommendation is to go ahead and proceed with doing some additional testing. In this case, colposcopy, looking with the microscope. So in terms of HPV vaccination, the recommendation is routine vaccination uh, starting at the age of approximately 11 to 12 years. Uh, but vaccination can be started as early as age nine and uh, going on all the way through the age of 26. The vaccine is given in two or three doses, depending on what age the initial vaccine uh, was given. And dosing schedules uh, for patients less than 15 years of age, uh, it would be given at time zero and then at six to 12 months after the first injection. So two doses for patients who are 15 to 26, the dosing interval is uh, three uh, doses uh, at time zero, approximately one to two months after, and then six months. So patients who can't receive the HPV vaccine, those who've had a severe allergic reaction, we always uh, fill out those forms, those questionnaires about whether we have it, had any uh, reaction to any component or a prior vaccine. Uh, and then those patients would not be eligible. Uh, patients who have a hypersensitivity or a reaction to yeast because the vaccine is actually produced in baker's yeast. And women who are pregnant should not receive the vaccine during the pregnancy. So currently the uh, nine-valent or non-avalent uh, HPV vaccine, and that just refers to the fact that it covers nine different types of HPV, um, is called Gardasil, and that protects against HPV 6 and 11, which are the main ones that cause genital warts, and then 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. So 16 and 18 are the majority of uh, cause of cervical cancers from 16 and 18, although 31 through 58 are also considered high risk um, HPV. So vaccination, what about in women older than uh, 26 years of age? So women older than 26, uh, the general recommendation is that they not be vaccinated. And so that may, uh, you know, strike uh, patients as that's odd. Why is it recommended from nine or so through 26, but not afterwards? And uh, the reason is that, you know, by a certain age, most women are likely to have had uh, their first intercourse or uh, have had sexual activity. And so those women have already been exposed to HPV and uh, anticipated benefit from a vaccination would be much less. Now, some women uh, or adults aged 27 to 45 may still decide to get the vaccine uh, in consultation with their physician, but just knowing that the benefit of the HP vaccine would be less in those patients as opposed to someone um, who had the vaccine prior to um, sexual activity. Uh, so this vaccine or the Gardasil vaccine was trialed in more than 15,000 um, men and women um, or females and males. Uh, and the main complaints were some pain and some swelling at the site of injection. Um, there have been maybe some patients with some slight fever, but these are kind of the most common reactions. Uh, so this has been a very well tolerated vaccine. Now for the last portion, I'll just talk about treatment of cervical cancer. Uh, and this image is that image of a, uh, my patient actually who underwent surgery for cervical cancer. And so uh, the metal clamp is holding a portion of the vagina anteriorly. Um, and we see the cervix with a hard nodular area that's protruding and that's the cancer, um, as well as the uterus and then the tubes and the ovaries off to the top on the left and right. The metal clamps on each side to the left and right of the cervix are on what we call the parametria, which is the tissue that cervical cancer were first spread to, if it were to spread outside of the cervix. And uh, we are uh, in a radical hysterectomy, we removed that area as well. So in terms of cervical cancer presentation, uh, many women are asymptomatic, meaning 
they don't know that there's anything abnormal and it's found on an exam or uh, abnormal screening. Uh, patients may also have abnormal vaginal bleeding, so uh, bleeding in between their periods, bleeding after intercourse, um, or certain change in their uh, menstrual period. Although the majority of them don't have cervical cancer, that can be uh, some of the presenting uh, signs. And patients who have had disease that is uh, advanced or has spread outside of the cervix may have pelvic pain. They may have difficulty with urination or defecation um, as the uh, cervical cancer can grow quite large. Uh, patients can have leg swelling, back pain, and also nerve-related um, issues, neuropathy. And when patients present with cervical cancer, uh, generally the part of the workup involves performing some sort of biopsy or removal of part of the cervix to diagnose it. Um, most common test performed is a PET CT scan, and that's a look for areas that light up in the body that would show where the cervical cancer has spread, if it has spread. And in patients uh, where there's a concern that it may have gone into the bladder or into the rectum, cystoscopy, uh, camera inside the bladder and proctoscopy um, is performed. Uh, HIV testing uh, is a consideration certainly as uh, patients with HIV have a immunocompromised system and uh, can have uh, HPV or the human papillomavirus um, be accelerated in terms of development of abnormal cells or cancer. We know also a risk factor for cervical cancer is smoking. So in those women, we do recommend smoking cessation. So we talk about staging, and so that's where cervical cancer is spread. And not to get into too much detail, but there are stages one, two, three, and four. The larger the cervix gets, the, you know, the stage does increase. And as the cervical cancer spreads outside of the cervix, the stage increases. So on the left side, there's stage 1A, and these are generally seven millimeters or less. And going to stage 1B, which there's 1B, 1, 2, and 3, these are lesions that are eight millimeters or greater, generally visible to the naked eye. Patients with stage two um, usually have the cervical cancer spread outside of the cervix into the parametria. That picture we showed earlier with the two metal clamps here, uh, holding on to the parametria. So the two metal clamps at the bottom of the image on the left and the right are holding on to what we call the parametria or the tissue just outside of the cervix. And if there's cancer in there, those patients are considered stage 2B. And patients who have the cancer now spread in the uh, upper right hand picture spread all the way to the bone or the pelvic bone that's considered stage 3B. If it goes into the bladder or the rectum, that's stage 4A. And then if it's spread beyond the pelvis, now into the belly or the abdomen, that's considered stage four. And staging is used as a prognostic indicator, meaning if I have the stage, how will I do? So obviously as the stage increases to one to two to three to four, the survival is worse. And you can see that in this graph here. So the uppermost line uh, is for stage 1A patients and the orange line at the bottom is for stage four patients. And the survival you can see is a big drop off where it's you know 95 percent plus for stage 1a dropping to maybe about 12 percent 15 percent for stage uh, 4b uh, and patients who have stage 1a1 or very small lesions generally seven millimeters or smaller if we look at the upper right uh, figure this was the area that i had cir uh, encircled that green rectangle prior we are removing what's called a cone. And if you see the dotted line, it's because it looks like an ice cream cone. And that's why we call it a cone of the cervix. And so patients who have an early cervical cancer that's small, um, who do want to have children in the future, can have this procedure called a conization procedure. I just performed one of these uh, just uh, before the new year on a patient who had cervical cancer found during her pregnancy and then delivered her baby. Um, had an uneventful delivery, the cervical cancer didn't progress, and I performed a cone procedure, and there was a minimal cervical cancer left. Um, so she's a patient who, after her cervix heals, can get pregnant again in the future. Now, the standard would be a hysterectomy, though, in patients who have even a small cervical cancer. 
what I discussed, doing something a little bit smaller, a cone or this ice cream cone shape removal of the cervix is for patients who want fertility sparing, meaning want to get pregnant in the future. Uh, in patients who have more advanced disease, uh, 1A2, 1B1, some 1B2s and 2As, uh, these patients undergo what's called a radical hysterectomy uh, as well as removal of lymph nodes. So there's a schematic on the left hand side and then there's a photo on the right hand side, the same photo that you've been seeing throughout this talk today. And that would be a specimen that's called a radical hysterectomy. And the reason for that is again, um, a portion or the upper portion of the vagina needs to be removed because it's right next to the cervix to check for cancer cells, as well as the tissue and the clamps, the lower clamps on the left and the right uh, are holding onto what's called a parametria. And that's where the cervical cancer would spread outside of the cervix into what we call the parametria, the tissue right next to the cervix. And so that's why this radical hysterectomy is done to check for cancer in those specific areas. In young women uh, whose ovaries look normal, ovaries can be left behind so that they don't go into menopause. And I do that quite a bit um, in women I diagnose with cervical cancer. So removing the ovaries is not necessarily a must, but it should be discussed with the physician on a case by case basis. So in terms of cervical cancer and treatment, we really talked about surgery mainly. And whenever we think about cancer, I think uh, most often patients will think, well, Dr. Lee, we should go and you know, perform surgery and get it out. We have to do a surgery and get out the cancer, right? And I say, yes, generally that's true. Now, cervical cancer is the one that's a little bit different from all the other cancers, ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, um, in uh, our field of gynecologic oncology because it's very sensitive to radiation, meaning radiation treats it very, very well. Now, there are groups of patients that undergo surgery and there's groups of patients that undergo radiation. Ideally, patients don't get both treatments because the risk of complications increases. Now, patients who have surgery, generally speaking, the tumors are smaller. Um, we want to preserve the ovaries, meaning that uh, we want to leave the ovaries in place. Um, because if you give patients radiation to the pelvic area, 100% of patients will go into menopause. The ovaries will fail. Uh, they're not candidates for radiation. Um, and I don't anticipate, meaning that based upon my exam and all the testing we do before any surgery, that I don't believe the likelihood of radiation is very high. Because as I had mentioned before, patients who need treatment and get surgery and radiation, their complication rates are much higher. Now patients uh, who undergo radiation, so radiation is a treatment that really only treats the area where you receive it, whereas chemotherapy generally goes all throughout the body through your veins. So basically all patients uh, can get radiation therapy. Um, radiation therapy is given with chemotherapy, meaning you get a weekly injection of one chemotherapy drug to help the radiation work better. It's called a radiation sensitizer. And radiation for cervical cancer um, is given approximately 28 fractions, meaning Monday through Friday, five and a half weeks. So it has to be given 28 times, and that's from the outside. And then radiation is delivered internally or through the vagina, and that's called brachytherapy afterwards. And the reason for that is you wanna treat the whole pelvis, but then you really wanna boost the dose to where the cervix is, and that's why brachytherapy is performed. Now, the outcomes between surgery and radiation, you might say, well, what's better? Is one better than the other? Is it similar? So the outcomes are very similar. 86% uh, survival at five years with surgery, 91% survival at five years with radiation. So it's essentially the same. Now, the complications are a little bit different. Um, surgery, because we have to take a portion of the vagina, we do have to move the bladder out of the way. And certainly after surgery, the bladder may not function for a period of time uh, in patients. Usually uh, it's maybe several days to a week, but sometimes it can be several weeks and in some cases, you know, can be permanent. So that's about 4%. On the radiation side, uh, these patients are at high risk for developing inflammation. So anybody who's received pelvic radiation, their intestines will never be the same again, meaning there's certain foods they won't be able to eat. Uh, during radiation is different. They may have certainly diarrhea issues, but after radiation, patients tend to have bowel movements where they go, 
but then they'll need to go again afterwards. They're not able to completely empty. The most concerning complication would be what we call a fistula, and that's when you have an abnormal connection between the rectum and the vagina or the bladder and the vagina, meaning urine can come out of the vagina or stool can come out of the vagina. And so patients are at even higher risk of these things happening if they have surgery and radiation. And so we try not to do both. Uh, special situations, um, someone's had a hysterectomy and then we found a small cervical cancer within it. Uh, depending on certain pathologic features, we may or may not need to do any further treatment. Uh, young women who have a cervical cancer that's not very small but not large, so stage 1A2 or 1B1, we can actually perform what's called a radical trachelectomy. And so that means basically performing the surgery you've seen earlier, the, uh, the image, uh, the photo of the radical hysterectomy, but uh, leaving the uterus behind. And so in this schematic, uh, we're showing that the cervix and the tissue next to the cervix, the parametria and the vagina was removed or the upper portion, and the uterus is then reattached to the vagina. And though these patients can get pregnant in the future, um, but if they get pregnant, they have to have a C-section. There is no other, because they have a cerclage. You may have heard that term before where basically the cervix is tightened. And that's done for patients who have had the cervix open early and have had premature delivery. Now that you don't have a cervix, you really have nothing holding the pregnancy back. And so that's only done with a stitch. And these patients must, must, must have a C-section. Cervical cancer diagnosed in pregnancy uh, depends on you know, how large the you know, cervical cancer is and how far along during pregnancy. And I've had patients certainly that uh, I've had just recently, as we had talked about, um, be treated and uh, with a small cone type procedure and are allowed to complete their pregnancy and then get treated afterwards. Patients who have had larger cervical cancers, I've had two patients in the last five years um, who really desire to uh, continue with their pregnancy. So they received chemotherapy and then delivered healthy children and then went back and had a radical hysterectomy. So that's an option too, but these are very special um, situations. Um, one other aspect I'd like to talk about is everyone talks about minimally invasive or camera-based surgery. You've heard the term laparoscopy, robotic surgery. Um, for a cervical cancer, uh, this type of minimally invasive surgery has been shown to increase the risk of cancer coming back or recurrence, and also to increase the risk of death from cancer. So this is essentially been banned um, and not being performed for cervical cancer. Uh, the benefit to having had done laparoscopy or robotic surgery is there's usually one centimeter incisions, three to four or five of them across the abdomen and uh, doing a surgery that way but uh, now it has to be an open incision, meaning either an up and down incision or a C-section type of incision to do the surgery. And smaller incisions, it's not just a cosmesis, but there's generally reduced pain. Most of these patients can go home the same day of surgery, but uh, for cervical cancer, we don't do these surgeries anymore. Um, and we still don't completely understand why uh, patients who have this type of surgery have an increased risk of cancer coming back or dying from the cancer itself. So these are some additional details, but for the sake of time, uh, I do want to make sure that uh, we get to just the summary. So the quick bullet points of what the talk was about. Um, in terms of screening and prevention, cervical cancer is very preventable. Uh, in terms of guidelines, we don't screen before the age of 25, and we generally don't screen after the age of 65, as long as patients have not had precancer and the last 10 years of screening has been negative or normal. Uh, screening should generally be every five years with an HPV test or with HPV and a pap smear. But if it's only a pap smear every three years. Now, this one, uh, people will have their own ways of doing it. Um, I certainly am not advocating that mine is the only way or the right way, but I do perform both tests every three years. HPV vaccination is recommended from age 11 to 12, uh, but it's approved anywhere from 9 to 26. And so it can be two or three doses. And this is generally uh, done by the pediatrician. So it's really important that uh, patients, but their parents really understand that, yes, it's against a sexually transmitted disease, but it is a vaccine to prevent cancer. In terms of treatment, um, 
early uh, cervical cancer can be treated usually with uh, local surgery. Um, and patients who have had larger cervical cancers typically will get chemo and radiation combined. Um, we didn't go into all the slides, but for recurrent disease, if cervical cancer were to come back, those patients in special situations can undergo what's called a pelvic exoneration. And that's a very large surgery where the bladder and usually the rectum and anus are removed. And patients have a bag for urine and a bag for stool on the outside. Um, in the last five years, I performed probably about 15 of these. Um, and when I discuss it with patients, um, we do do the surgery because it's the only chance for cure for patients who have cervical cancer come back and it's limited to a central area. And that, uh, you know, survival rate is approximately 50% in five years for patients who undergo surgery. Well, I thank you very much for your attention. I know it's a lot of information taken. I hope it was beneficial. And I do wish everyone, uh, you know, a better 2021 uh, compared to 2020. It's been a tough year the last year. And I hope um, you haven't had any uh, major family issues. Um, so please stay safe and be well. And if there's any questions I can answer, I'd love to do that. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. This was so informative. I am walking away with so much information and behind the scenes, a lot of our staff right now is also texting saying that we're walking away with such useful information and undoubtedly people in attendance are as well. A few questions came through. Um, one is wondering about those that have had an ablation. What is the risk of HPV risk of cervical cancer? So in terms of ablation, I, I guess is a question, um, ablation of the cervix. Uh, that's something that was done in the past. It was called cryoablation, where essentially the cervix was frozen or a portion of it was frozen. Uh, if patients are referring to what's called endometrial or inside the uterus ablation, that's typically done for patients who have very heavy periods to stop the bleeding. So if it's done for that reason, endometrial or uterine ablation, that would not affect the cervix. Um, the cryoablation was used in the past to help treat abnormal cells. Um, that would not prevent you from getting cervical cancer, so you still need screening. I'm not sure if I answered that um, specifically but for the person who uh, asked the question. It says yes, a uterine ablation. Yeah, so uterine ablation does not affect the cervix at all, correct? Great. A few more questions. Um, if you've had a hysterectomy and cervical removal, can one still, this may be a little bit outside the scope of the, this presentation, but the question is, can one still develop vaginal cancer? Or better question is, how does one develop vaginal cancer? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so vaginal cancer is much, much less common than cervical cancer. Um, and HPV is also the causative agent for vaginal cancer in a great majority of cases. So. That's true, even if you've had a hysterectomy, can you get a vaginal cancer? You can, so I still advocate women, whether you get a pap smear once a year or not, um, it really is important to have a gynecologic exam. And I certainly think primary care doctors do a great job of doing pap smears. I'm not, not saying that they um, you know, shouldn't be doing them, but without seeing a gynecologist, you really don't have someone who has expertise of looking at the cervix and the vagina, knowing what they're seeing to make that determination of, hey, is this normal? Is this abnormal? Is this something that I should refer to someone like myself, a gynecologic oncologist? And so even with hysterectomy, correct, the vagina is there. And so it certainly is at risk potentially for developing a vaginal cancer. Now, in women who've had normal pap smears and now with HPV testing normal, the likelihood is quite low, particularly if you don't have new partners. But uh, something I do differently too is even if women are over 65, if they have new partners, they can be reintroduced to HPV. And, you know, women are living longer and are sexually active to um, much older ages than they used to be. Um, men have additional medications to be sexually active to an older age. And, you know, as we talked about at the very beginning of the talk, um, approximately 20% of cervical cancer is actually found in women over 65. So it's very important to remember that. Although the majority of those women, it's because they weren't uh, undergoing screening. Great. I see one more question on the chat. Um, have you heard of AHCC supplements? It claims to prevent HPV. No, I haven't. It's something I should look up. AHCC? No, I've not heard of that, but it's something I certainly should look up.
you know, to the best of my knowledge, um, I don't know of any supplement um, that prevents HPV. It may be something that they consider to be immune boosting, maybe. But, uh, you know, that's, you know, having an intact immune system, not smoking, those are probably the two most important things for not developing or uh, cervical cancer or helping clear the HPV. And I'm seeing another one. Um, is the BRCA gene uh, related to cervical cancer? Or are there other um, genetic components to cervical cancer? That's a great question. So uh, one, uh, cervical cancer doesn't appear to be a genetically um, related cancer, meaning that HPV is a virus that's not, genetic, not generally passed on because you have a genetic susceptibility. Now, if your immune system is not um, functioning normally, that can be passed on genetically. So uh, that may be potentially a risk factor. Now, with respect to the BRCA or BRCA, so those patients are generally at elevated risk for breast and ovarian cancer. So something a little bit different, but within my field of cancers. Great. Um, a revisit to the ablation question. What if it's been a cervical ablation? Is there still a risk of cervical cancer to be aware of? Yeah, so uh, if patients are referring to kind of having a cryoablation or a freezing of a portion of the cervix, then yes, uh, the cervix still is at risk, the organ exists, and so you should still undergo screening. Um, there really isn't a, uh, for lack of a better word, a burning of the entire cervix. That's not a procedure that's generally performed. So I'm assuming she's referring to cryoablation, which was done in the past, but not so much now. Um, those patients should still get screened. Wonderful. Well, are there any other questions? You're welcome to type them into the chat or unmute yourself. Okay. I think those are all the questions. I'm seeing a lot of great comments, great info, surprise about um, the low rate of patients receiving the HPV vaccination. So maybe we can all do our job in educating our loved ones about that vaccination. Um, but I think that's all for now. So thank you so much for your time, Dr. Lee. We really appreciate it and gain. Thank you, much. Dr. Lee. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, thank you, everybody. Um, you know, I know it's hard to listen to any kind of lecture. I'm, I'm not a lecture person. Uh, so I very much appreciate your time. Um, Rachel, thank you so much for organizing and be happy to come back anytime and talk about another topic that uh, may be helpful to everybody. Thank you. Thank so you much. again. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you, bye-bye. If all of you could stay on just one more moment, I'm gonna launch a workshop review right now and that really helps us for future presentations. So go ahead and complete that at your convenience.